I'm really grateful for our partnership. A lot of the underlying technology for the future of computing is still in the research phase, but we have working demos of this stuff and it's pretty mind blowing. And it wouldn't be Connect if we didn't share some of that with you. So let's start with one of the technologies that we think is gonna be really important for the future. I've talked a lot about neural interfaces in our research on EMG before, and we now have a working demo that lets you control an AR or VR device with motor neuron signals. Now I'm not gonna show you the headset this year, but here's what I'm seeing while I'm using this. Just the gentlest flick of my thumb to check my messages, and with another quick movement, I can answer while I'm on the move, uh, or I can even take a photo. Now the goal here is to make these interfaces faster, higher bandwidth, and a lot more natural. All right, so to close us out today, let's check in with Michael to talk about our progress here and what still needs to get solved. Hey. Hi, Mark. The future that all that new technology is creating is one that will change the world every bit as much as personal computing and mobile did. Yeah, and a big part of this is gonna be building next generation interfaces, like the neural interface CMG demo that we just showed. That's right. And there's an important lesson to be learned from personal computing. What we saw there was that the interface to the digital world, the graphical user interface, was what defined the user experience and opened up new possibilities. Our challenge is that GUIs just can't do the job for glasses that have to work in all the situations we encounter in the course of a day, so we need something radically new. In addition to new interfaces, we're also going to need a whole layer that can sense and reconstruct the world around you, understand the context in which you're using these devices, and also just help you get things done when you have these digital capabilities mixed with the physical world. And this is really the job for AI. Yes, in the long run, I'm confident that the most powerful way to interact with the metaverse will be through personalized AI. Thanks to the glasses, AI will be able to understand your context and will use that to help you proactively, ideally so seamlessly that you won't even notice. Now, combine that with electromyography technology, EMG, which uses the neuromuscular signals through your wrist directly as inputs, and you have an intuitive, almost frictionless interface. This will be the first truly human-centered interface. And a big part of that is that you won't have to learn how to use a rigid control scheme. Instead, the machine will learn and adapt to you as you use it. In neuroscience, this concept is known as co-adaptation. And what that means to all of us is that by combining machine learning with neuroscience, this future interface will work with each user to adapt to their unique differences in physiology, sizes, preferences, and expectations. Here, you can see two people playing an arcade game with EMG. They're both using the same gesture, but because no two people are exactly alike, they do it in slightly different ways. The neural interface continuously gets better over time at understanding each person. The potential for co-adaptation extends beyond normal gestures into some truly novel territory. Here, the algorithm is learning in real time how to respond to the EMG signals the person is sending with only the slightest of hand movements. The system is recognizing the actions the person has decided to perform by decoding those signals at their wrist and translating them into digital commands. And now, the person is able to communicate their intended actions to the computer with almost no hand movement. This is a genuine transformation in the way we interact with the digital world. Yeah, this has the potential to redefine a lot of how we interact with computers. And you know, if you think about the step change in capability that came with the mouse and graphical user interface, this should be another big step beyond that in speed and the bandwidth of our interfaces. And you know, this is one of the wildest projects I think that we're working on. These future interfaces will be truly life-changing. An example that I love is Carnegie Mellon University's NAVCOG project to help the visually impaired. Our Project ARIA research classes can 3D map their surroundings, so CMU used them to build phone maps that enable the visually impaired to navigate more confidently indoors, where GPS signals often don't reach. Here's a look at how this works. For years, I've gotten around with the assistance of my guide dog, Flirt. I love and depend on her dearly, but a guide dog is not a navigation system. Juice bar is on your right. NAVCOG can change that. There is a ramp, 140 feet. What we're working on is a turn-by-turn -turn 
assistive technology that we've developed at Carnegie Mellon University. We teamed up with Reality Labs and Meta and started using their Project ARIA research glasses to build a 3D map of the Pittsburgh International Airport. The maps help the user figure out where they are without having to rely so heavily on external beacons. This is huge because it makes NAVCOG scalable. NAVCOG gives me the freedom to go where I need to go. You have arrived. It really helps me regain my independence. All right, so this is a great example of how, you know, when you're building these systems that are oriented around people and how we experience the world, it opens up all of these new avenues to help us do more. Because it turns out that the things that you need to do to model reality, like being able to sense the world around you and understand the context for how it all fits together, that's the same thing that you need to augment human capabilities too. Macular degeneration runs in my family, so I may actually be using the fruits of this research myself one day. Helping the hearing impaired is also on the horizon, and that's another thing that runs in my family. I didn't set out to build glasses for my future self, but it does seem to be working out that way. There's so much more that the interface of the future will bring us, like the ability to right-click on a real object to find out information about it, control our devices without looking down, and get proactive assistance from a personalized digital assistant. We will one day be using this interface to do everything we do now, but more easily, plus a ton of things we haven't even thought of that we'll consider indispensable. Yeah, so one example is being able to build and manipulate complex 3D objects. And you know this is central to the metaverse, but it's hard to build 3D objects from scratch. It's much quicker and easier to just use physical objects as, as templates. Today, there's no easy way to do that. So we're researching two different technologies to solve that problem. The first one uses machine learning based neural radiance fields to reconstruct the appearance of a 3D object from multiple 2D images taken at different angles. This method can reproduce even the finest details of an object. All right, so we're gonna scan Teddy, uh, not just because he's super cute, but also because he's got the right dimensions and level of detail for what we're trying to replicate. So here's how it works. So we just scan him on the phone. And that's about it. Right now this takes some processing time, so we got it ready beforehand so we could check it out. Oh wow, the level of detail in this is impressive. You can kind of see all these fine elements of it, like each individual strand of its hair. And you can even see through the semi-transparent bow tie that he has on. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's just a beautiful reproduction. The second technology captures geometry and appearance directly. So here we used a, a different technique called inverse rendering to scan an object into its digital twin and then bring it into augmented and virtual reality. And it responds dynamically to the lighting in the VR environment. And you know, when you throw it in the air uh, against a wall or if you bounce it off the ground, it's gonna respond the same way that the physical object would. So we use Spark to put the virtual object next to the physical one here. They're almost identical. Neither approach is real time yet and each has its limitations. But the goal is to let you quickly and easily make physical objects a part of your virtual world. Of course, the most interesting virtual elements of all are other people in the form of avatars. And as you mentioned earlier, avatars will come in a variety of styles, but one thing I know for sure is that avatars that are photorealistic representations of users would be the most powerful remote connection technology that has ever existed they would create genuine social presence in the sense of making you feel at a gut level like you are literally with other people and would span personal distances in a way video conferencing can only dream of. This is one reason we believe the metaverse is going to be by far the most social computing platform. It's fundamentally about people and about being with people. So we're gonna be able to teleport anywhere and be with anyone no matter how far apart we physically are. And I think that this is the ultimate goal of social technology. And you're right, one of the keys that will unlock this is avatars that truly represent us. So last year, we showed you early progress on full body codec avatars. Then what sets codec avatars apart from other high quality avatars that you might've seen is that they're fully drivable. So that means that they're not limited to preset movements or expressions. This is an avatar that you can control live in real time with 
no need to render or export video. So it can photorealistically reproduce individual people rather than just you know, generic characters that artists designed. Of course, securing your avatar will be critical. We're already thinking about things like encryption and tying your avatar to an authenticated account. But beyond privacy, we've continued to develop this technology. For example, it's now possible to change your virtual outfit whenever you want. Cool as that is, it's the face, expressions, eye contact, slight motions, that is most quintessentially human. We're putting a lot of research into making the faces of our codec avatars truer to our physical forms. Mark, do you want to show us the latest in codec faces? Yeah, definitely. You know, last year during our visit to the lab at Redmond, I, I saw the second generation of our codec avatars. So these second generation avatars are, are pretty amazing, right? They're much closer to how you might want to show up in a setting like a work meeting. So I made one of myself. Now we've made them a lot more expressive. And not just simple things like looking left, right, up, down, but also the nonverbal cues that we rely on to communicate with each other and understand tone. Things like raising an eyebrow, squinting, uh, widening my eyes, or scrunching my nose. You know, these avatars are way better at capturing those subtleties that define physical interactions. They're just much more natural. And being able to control the lighting on the avatars adds another dimension of life to them. When we move the light around, you can see how it interacts with my hair, it reflects on my skin, and you can even see it in my eyes. Now, these are awesome, but they also take a really long time to generate. So we're working on something that's a lot quicker for people to use. And we've made a lot of progress with what we call instant avatars. So here's Autumn from our RL Labs team doing a demo of the process to show exactly what goes into this. These are much quicker and easier to make. All you need for the scan is your phone, and you can pretty much do this anywhere with reasonable lighting. She scans her face from different angles with a neutral expression for about 30 seconds, then spends another minute and a half making a variety of expressions. And that's really all there is to it. Hi guys, my 3D avatar is ready for use in my phone or VR. It just took a few hours to generate after my scan and the team's working on making that processing a whole lot faster. Now, obviously this isn't the same quality as you just saw with the 2.0 codec avatars. However, they're still pretty expressive and realistic. We're putting a whole lot of effort into developing these so anyone can easily create their own high quality, realistic avatar for themselves. All right, thanks, Autumn. Now, this is some of the most inspiring stuff that, that I feel like we get to work on. So it, it's great that we're at the stage now where the research foundations that we've laid over the past years are, are really starting to show up in, in real products. For sure. There's still plenty left to do, and everything we've just talked about is still research. It may or may not end up in our products, but it's definitely a glimpse of where technology is headed. Thanks, Mark.